Um, yeah, I want to welcome everybody uh, to this uh, uh, presentation from the Savannah Institute as part of uh, Illinois Stewardship Alliance's mm -hmm. Soil Health Week uh, for this year. Uh, we're here to talk about soil health in agroforestry or how trees can be uh, arboreal allies uh, uh, to soils and, and other crops on Illinois farmlands. So really appreciate Illinois Stewardship Alliance's initiative in um, uh, creating a platform for this and other talks that, uh, that have uh, happened uh, this past week. Uh, I think there's at least one more in this series tomorrow. And if you visit uh, uh, ilstewards.org, uh, I'll bet you can, uh, can find the info on that uh, pretty readily. Um, yeah, so uh, you'll hear today from three of us from the Savannah Institute. Uh, I am the Director of Research and Commercialization there. Uh, and then also from my colleagues, uh, Sven Peel, uh, our Illinois Technical Service Provider, and Nate Lawrence, our Ecosystem Scientist. I um, want to also uh, recognize Katie Adams, who coordinated uh, a lot of this on our end and, and picked the, uh, the killer title, if any of you know Katie in the audience, you may, may instantly see her influence in that. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Savannah Institute, uh, we're a nonprofit organization uh, based in Champaign, Illinois and Madison, Wisconsin, uh, celebrating our 10th anniversary uh, this year. So founded in 2013. Um, and uh, our work mm -hmm. is laying the groundwork for widespread agroforestry in the Midwest. Uh, we focus on uh, nothing but agroforestry and everything uh, within agroforestry. Uh, and so the way our time will kind of go here today is uh, I'll say a couple more things uh, here uh, you know, orientation wise uh, to, uh, to what this uh, agroforestry thing is. Um, and then we'll hear from uh, Nate Lawrence uh, on the, the science of soil health mm -hmm. in, in agroforestry systems. Uh, and uh, kind of where things stand on, on what you could expect if you uh, applied agroforestry uh, on your farm uh, from a, a principal standpoint. And then Sven Peel is going to talk about uh, how he and his uh, colleagues at the Savannah Institute uh, and our farmer engagement team uh, can work directly with farmers and, and landowners to uh, kind of uh, um, size up those principles of soil health and, and, and other aspects of agroforestry relative to the unique situation of, of your farm. Um, so feel free if you have uh, questions uh, during the talk, feel free to pose those, but then we'll also try to finish with a generous amount of time uh, at the end here for Q&A and, and discussion. So uh, agroforestry, uh, the, 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 the definition of it uh, that I uh, like the best, I think, uh, is one that uh, our executive director, Keith Keeley, uses, and that is uh, growing trees uh, with crops on purpose, uh, which is an important caveat in ag and, and land management, whether it's on purpose. But it's about right. Agroforestry mm -hmm. is uh, a perennial agriculture practice uh, that involves uh, intentionally integrating uh, trees into the ag landscape, um, both uh, for their own merits uh, and uh, for the synergy uh, between tree crops uh, and other field crops like grain crops, vegetable crops, uh, and with livestock uh, like uh, grazing animals. Uh, agroforestry is, um, is uh, an agricultural production system. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there are, are lots of options for using uh, harvestable uh, fruit and nut trees, for using uh, trees that can provide um, browse or otherwise provide livestock feed. And so it's directly a source of food, but then it's also a source uh, of a, a really diverse uh, portfolio of, of ecosystem services. Um, uh, like uh, you know, potentially uh, carbon sequestration, uh, like improved drinking water quality, uh, reduced soil erosion, um, synergistic effects uh, uh, here, um, uh, relieving uh, you know, wind stress uh, from grain crops or uh, heat stress uh, from livestock. Uh, and can be part of just in general um, uh, a hopeful vision for uh, diversifying, re-diversifying our agricultural system and uh, mm -hmm. making it something that, that works for everybody. 
Um, agroforestry comes in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Uh, traditionally, the agroforestry community uh, talks about five specific mm -hmm. uh, practices or systems that agroforestry can fit in. And of course, there's a, a, lot of, um, a lot of other ways to put it together. But to just give you a flavor of what this can look like, uh, alley cropping is, is the practice of planting rows of trees uh, and then grain or vegetable crops typically uh, in the alleys in between here. And uh, this is a system uh, that can look like uh, small scale farming. It can also look like very large scale farming um, and is, uh, is a way to integrate with, uh, with field crops. Silva pasture, uh, whether you're planting trees in rows or in some other configuration, is sort of like alley cropping, uh, but for integration with grazing livestock, whether that's cattle, small ruminants, uh, poultry um, here, and trying to leverage uh, benefits for uh, both forage crops uh, and for the livestock uh, themselves. Um, you know, those uh, last two, um, alley cropping and silvopasture, you might call um, in-field practices, you know, middle of the field practices. Uh, there are also edge of field practices that agroforestry can be deployed in. Uh, riparian buffers uh, here that are providing uh, water quality and soil uh, erosion reduction and other benefits uh, next to surface waters could also uh, be growing a, a harvestable um, tree fruit or nut crop. Uh, and then windbreaks, another edge of field uh, practice that is uh, trying to modify the micro environment of the field in a favorable way and can also be combined with uh, harvestable tree crops. Um, and then finally, uh, a system that is, um, is, uh, has a lot of relevance uh, in Southern Illinois, uh, in Northwestern Illinois, uh, or anywhere uh, there's, uh, there's woodland here is forest farming is growing uh, typically small scale um, specialty crops under an existing forest canopy in a, a sustainable way. Um, and then not encompassed by these practices, but still definitely agroforestry in my view uh, are just diversified, sustainable, um, management uh, of um, tree crops uh, in an orchard, in a field configuration where you're bringing uh, biodiversity in one form or another and, and bringing ecological management. And so, you know, we think that across this full scope of agroforestry, there's a lot of really applicable tools in the toolbox here uh, for a lot of people's farms uh, that can achieve a lot of goals uh, towards agricultural sustainability and, and a more resilient food system. Um, and soil health is, is of particular importance as, as one of those uh, outcomes here. And so with that, uh, I'll transition over uh, to, uh, to Nate uh, to talk about uh, kind of the basis and the potential uh, for soil health in agroforestry. Nate? Yeah, thanks, Fred. Yeah, so I'd like to sort of help contextualize what soil health means and how we would actually go about uh, measuring meaningful impacts to soil health. Uh, Fred, we can go ahead and advance. So first I'd like to highlight the, the NRCS definitions of soil health metrics. I'm assuming because you're here at this uh, presentation, you're probably fairly familiar uh, with these principles, but I'd like to highlight a few of them that uh, sometimes go underappreciated and I think uh, are worth noting before we move on. The first is this principle that water uh, can either flow over land or uh, into and through soil. And if soil health practices can increase the amount of water that infiltrates into the soil rather than flows off the surface, that has a number of uh, meaningful improvements. So that means there's more water for crops to uh, access later during some dry period after a rainfall. And it's also really important in reducing the flood risk of watersheds. So there's been a lot of work that perennializing watersheds has an enormous impact on downstream flooding potential because it increases the amount of water that can infiltrate into the soil. And this is going to become more critical as climate change uh, further increases the amount of extreme precipitation events we have and the risk of flooding generally uh, becomes greater. The second is in uh, sustaining plant and animal life is the way it's defined here. 
And I'll note that while we talk about soil health, uh, sometimes there's a, a very uh, ecological and, and less sort of farm centric lens that we, we use uh, when describing it. So uh, it's worth noting that a lot of these metrics are tied to improved uh, plant uh, outcomes, including crop performance, and there's a lot of work that's going into tying which metrics are most important for that, uh, that I'll touch on a little bit later. And then finally, of course, nutrients uh, stored, transformed, and cycled in soil. And that includes uh, plant nutrients like nitrogen or phosphorus. And it also includes uh, carbon, which is carrying a lot of those nutrients and is in and of itself a, uh, an aspect of soil that we would like to, to increase for climate reasons and also for a handful of other reasons. So the principles that the NRCS uh, suggest for improving soil health include minimizing disturbance, maximizing biodiversity, maximizing soil cover, and maximizing living roots. And with that, we'll uh, go to the next slide. So why would agroforestry be particularly relevant for accomplishing some of these goals? And this is a really timely presentation because we're starting to see the first papers trickle out of a, a big research group led by the Soil Health Institute that looked at the very long list of potential variables that we might correlate to soil health and looked at uh, which, which variables change with practices and which variables are tied to ecosystem outcomes that we might like to see. So on the left of this uh, heat map, we have a long list of uh, possible uh, soil health variables. These include biotic variables, uh, you know, measures of what the microbial community might be up to. They include physical principles like increasing soil structure, uh, aggregate stability. They include some crop uh, relevant, uh, very crop relevant principles. I suppose they're all crop relevant, but um, things like field capacity, how much water uh, the soil can actually store, as well as a number of uh, nutrient cycling and carbon storage uh, variables as well, like uh, soil organic carbon and uh, potential mineralization, which is essentially how much of that carbon can microbes uh, actually access and over a period of time consume, thereby mineralizing and releasing the associated nutrients. And then on the, the top, we have a number of different practices that they were able to look at over uh, many farms, over 100 total farms uh, spread out across North America. And that includes crop count, how many crops are being grown at one time, uh, decreased tillage practices, uh, adoption of cover crops, adoption of organic amendments like manure, for example, uh, residue retention, to be increasing the amount of residue that's left on the soil versus removed, and also rotation diversity. And these would be in a crop rotation, how many uh, crops are included in that total rotation. So you can see kind of a smattering of uh, which, which practices were associated with uh, which improvements in soil health variables. But you'll note that none of these practices were agroforestry. And I think this is partly due to the, the, the relatively small number of field sites that are uh, in some sort of agroforestry uh, practice to be researched, but we can probably uh, assume, uh, hopefully, that agroforestry certainly accomplishes some of these goals. So uh, perennial agriculture uh, decreases or really completely eliminates uh, the need for tillage. Um, while cover crops may or may not be intentionally used in, in the system, perennial plants are perhaps the ultimate cover crop. Um, organic amendments, if, if, uh, if those are being used or would be common in, in these systems. Residue retention, typically perennial agriculture is going to have uh, pretty complete soil coverage through uh, pretty much the entire year, if not the entire year. And then rotation diversity and crop count are two that uh, agroforestry also uh, by definition um, incorporates a lot of. So, Without having specific uh, agroforestry practices here, it, it'll be great to actually see if agroforestry provides a lot of green on this chart, meaning that it's really impacting these uh, different variables. But I think we can um, hopefully go forward 
with the hypothesis that agroforestry is going to be sort of a combination of all of these things and a lot of them sort of done to the nines. And with that, we'll uh, move to the next slide. So why would we expect agroforestry to have a, an impact? And in particularly, why would, why would we have, expect agroforestry to have an impact perhaps above and beyond that of perennial management, which we already know is associated with uh, some of the highest rates of soil carbon accrual, some of the fastest changes and improvements in soil health uh, characteristics. And one that I'll point out is that woody plants in general tend to be very deep rooted. So this is a, an image of an excavated uh, root system. This was done uh, in a, a German uh, study, and then they, they drew and diagrammed out the roots of entire trees and all sorts of other plants and their kind of beautiful works of art, as well as uh, interesting from a scientific perspective. And I'll note here that we're looking at a, a hybrid poplar, which is a, a species that we would uh, incorporate in some agroforestry systems. The y-axis, which is a little bit hard to read down here on the bottom left corner, uh, that bottom number is 300 centimeters or three meters. So this hybrid poplar has a pretty extensive root system and a lot of that root system is going all the way down to three meters. So if you're familiar with rooting depths, that's extremely deep and those roots are in the soil uh, year round and, and able to take up nutrients as well as contributing carbon and all of the other things that we know living roots do. It's notable as well uh, when we think about agroforestry and how trees might be implemented uh, in, in combination with herbaceous plants, whether those are perennials or perhaps annuals in, in an alley cropping system. And if we can uh, either select species that have a deeper rooting system and then plant them at some interval across a field, you might actually be able to get all the benefits of stacking a, a deeper rooted species and a more shallow rooted species in the same system while minimizing the underground competition, the direct competition that these two uh, crop species would have and provide another safety net of roots underneath the rooting system of uh, pasture grasses perhaps or uh, annual crops um, in an alley crop system. With that, I'll go to the next slide. So how are we actually going about getting a lot of these uh, measurements made in agroforestry systems? And in general, general, we're relying on a before after control impact experiment design. So we have uh, some acreage we're planting an agroforestry system and we'll start making measurements uh, when that agroforestry system is planted. And then we'll also identify nearby controls uh, where they, the conventional agricultural practices in the Midwest, that's often going to be annual uh, corn or corn soy rotation, which is the dominant ag practice, as I'm sure we're all familiar with. So we could uh, include a control as well as uh, baseline soil uh, health characteristics at the time of planting. And then we can come back and resample both of those sites over uh, an in interval of several years to uh, identify the changes that are happening due to agroforestry and also isolate those changes from other uh, things that might be impacting the soil, like changes in climate, for example. And with that, I'll go to the next slide. So what soil measurements are we actually making at Savannah Institute? And I, I have to go back and, and verbally cite again, the, the Soil Health Institute and particularly the work of, uh, of Dan Lipson there, who's, who's done a lot of uh, recent, created a couple of recent publications of kind of extracting which variables have the most uh, information and which are most likely to change. So this is informed by a lot of work at the Soil Health Institute. Uh, we're looking at soil carbon, both uh, because of its climate impact. It's formerly a, uh, a greenhouse gas that now works for uh, socially responsible causes. It's also a reservoir of soil nutrients and a sponge for absorbing water. Um, at the same time, we'll also look at to total nitrogen. This is uh, the most common limiting nutrient in our part of the world, and also a form of uh, nitrogen that responds uh, well to management. And if we run our soil carbon samples on an elemental analyzer, which is a fairly common analysis, we get total carbon and uh, a total nitrogen as well. So you get two, two for one uh, with that analysis. 
We'll look at bulk density, which is required for scaling any of our uh, chemical measurements up so that we know uh, from uh, grams per kilogram, we can scale that to uh, kilograms per acre, for example. Uh, on some subset of samples, we'll also look at texture, uh, which allows us to, in combination with these other variables, estimate uh, both um, how water will infiltrate into to a system, uh, as well as how much total water a soil is able to store and, and release to crops uh, during dry periods. And uh, we'll also probably look at soil uh, surface and subsurface hardness uh, at a lot of our sites. And that's a relative value of, of soil compaction. It's very easy to make in the field. So you're able to actually map uh, soil hardness at a, a level of spatial granularity that's very uncommon in, in soil studies. So that's kind of interesting in its own right. And on the next slide, we have some uh, deeper cuts, uh, variables that we'd like to measure pretty widely, um, but some of them will probably uh, be on some subset of sites where we can, for example, get soils and get them shipped off, shipped off to a lab or analyzed very quickly. Uh, potential mineralization is how much of that soil carbon can actually be mineralized in a given period of time and under set conditions. So this is kind of a measure of how much work the soil carbon is actually doing in terms of providing nutrients to a crop, for example. Uh, wet aggregate stability is a measure of soil structure uh, that impacts infiltration, as well as a, a number of, uh, primarily infiltration is, is the one that we'd really like to tie that to. And in combination with these other variables, we can predict soil infiltration uh, very accurately, which is useful because it's very hard to measure that directly in the field. Um, and also wet aggregate stability might be able to be measured through image analysis using a phone. So that would dr drastically reduce the amount of uh, expense of, of measuring this directly. Uh, soil pH will measure pretty widely. It's, it's pretty simple um, kind of base level uh, variable that we'd like to look at. And that helps inform agricultural management. And it also identifies where we might need to be concerned about some of the soil carbon in our total carbon uh, being inorganic, and so not, not soil organic carbon. In that case, we need to uh, quantify inorganic carbon, subtract it from total carbon to, to get soil, uh, soil organic carbon. And that's likely where uh, soils are greater than uh, 6.5 pH. On where we're interested, particularly for agricultural management, we'll look at uh, phosphorus, potassium, as well as a number of metals and ions that form uh, trace nutrients for uh, various plants. And also uh, for phosphorus, uh, a really uh, potential water pollutant. So if your site is enrolled in a SNAP program, for example, uh, they're really interested in uh, the, the amount of phosphorus that's in the soil because that helps uh, them de design systems that uh, remove phosphorus from our, our water. So that's uh, as kind of getting two, two birds for one uh, stone. And then Future work will likely look at any number of additional variables. I'd like to measure some of these things in field conditions um, rather than in lab conditions, which might be a little bit more relevant for, uh, for some types of questions. So that could include um, uh, intact soil cores and looking at their uh, water holding capacity, which is another variable suggested by the Soil Health Institute. Um, and then sort of any number of other variables, uh, my own work, in the past has suggested that uh, net nitrogen mineralization, which is the amount of nitrogen that can be mineralized over a, a short period of time, is, is more variable than a lot of other, the, uh, uh, excuse me, other nitrogen uh, metrics that we might look at. And then finally, you know, we could even do some, some isotope work on, on some of our sites. So uh, plenty of future work. Uh, most of these soils are going to be measured at minimum to 30 centimeters and then uh, some subset will also be measured uh, down to one meter to capture some of the deeper uh, soil, carb soil uh, processes that are going on. Uh, and then the next slide. So finally, an area that's receiving a whole lot of work, but so far that work uh, hasn't been published is which soil health variables are most tied to crop performance. So this is something that I expect a lot more insight on in the coming two or three years. And uh, it, it, as we know which of these variables are most critical, critical for crop performance, we'll probably 
uh, try to scale up uh, those measurements. And with that, I will hand it off to Sven. Great, uh, thank you, Nate. It, uh, so Nate's kind of given you a sense of uh, what we know and, and can have a pretty strong hunch about from the state of the science um, on the benefits agroforestry can provide, uh, both just for uh, the, the, the ecosystem and the world around us and, and maybe for performance on a particular farm. And he's uh, also shared uh, what we're doing to make sure that we're learning more, uh, even as the next wave of agroforestry farms are starting up. And uh, so, so Sven uh, uh, can, uh, can talk to us about uh, what uh, assistance the Savannah Institute can provide uh, if you think you might be part of that next wave. Sven. Good morning, everybody. Um, Fred, can you pull up my slide, please? Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, this slide here basically sh is a, an outward facing uh, document, um, uh, a summary of our of the work that we do as technical service providers, the work that we do with uh, clients such as yourselves. Um, uh, internally, there's a lot more that goes on and I'm actually going to allow you to, well, I'll go through this and then um, uh, go through our actual process. So we provide one-on-one -on -one support. Uh, we will work closely with you to build a custom agroforestry plan that will be your roadmap for success. Um, this year is the beginning of uh, our cohort model. Um, so you'll, as, as a client, as a landowner, uh, you'll be part of a cohort that is invited to field days, farm tours, and workshops. And this allows us to uh, streamline our processes into a tighter calendar schedule. Um, where we're working more on, you know, in one part of the season, we're doing site visits, and then we're, we're in another part or another, you know, let's say within a week of that, we're having a meeting with clients one-on-one, uh, -on -one, and then a week after that, we're in design mode, and just allows us to uh, focus our uh, attention to specific tasks. Um, we share and have a lot of uh, material on agroforestry, be it videos, written material, and updates about relevant learning opportunities, such as field days and um, information that's coming out from our website. We've got the perennial AF podcast and, and so on. Um, one thing that we're strengthening this year is the farm narrative. And this is a process that comes out of holistic management where um, it's very important to get a landowner to understand how they wish to live their life and what their goals are and, and understand how they're looking to achieve them. And then what we do on the design side is mesh that with your landscape to produce a design. Um, we perform a site visit, that's one of our steps. At times, and depending on a client's interest, we bring out the NRCS or soil and water from your region to uh, perform this site visit with us. And um, some of that there too is because there's uh, for cost share funding for these practices, um, the NRCS, and we work on it with this a little bit too, but um, look for resource concerns. So for the, for the federal government to support uh, the public in the implementation of these agroforestry practices, those practices are to mitigate, a, excuse me, I'm sorry, are to mitigate a resource concern. Um, as you heard, Nate was uh, speaking of, you know, infil water infiltration, carbon sequestration. Carbon sequestration is coming into the narrative or into the lexicon of the NRCS as a resource concern. And I think as we see more uh, work being done in the realm of carbon sequestration, we'll see that resource concern grow. Um, I did wanna note that the different practices that Fred shared earlier on in the presentation weigh differently in regards to resource concerns. So if you can imagine a single row of trees on a slope they will um, slow water, like 
uh, Nate was talking about with surface water or uh, uh, in-ground water. A single row of trees will slow water less so than multiple rows of trees. And if you saw that riparian buffer, it has depth to it for that purpose. And so these are the types of things that we incorporate into our design or make recommendations on what practice is best to, to mitigate said resource concern. And our goal in working with you is to get the, the, this practice documentation uh, supported by the local office, local NRCS office. This is for cost share. Um, then that, in, so it get, your project gets ranked. That goes up to the state level. It gets ranked again. And hopefully within a couple months, you find out, um, or a few months, you find out whether there's going to be cost share assistance from uh, the NRCS. We are working on crunching numbers for you and, and or with you. <clears throat> it's very important that uh, that a farmer understands their finances. And right now, we're primarily working with implementation costs because the, the, the variables outside of implementation can be vast. It's a, that's a far uh, larger uh, pool of information that has to be worked with. Um, so at this point in time, we're working primarily with the cost of implementation, and that's relative to the implementation cost share from the, from the NRCS slash USDA. Uh, as, as shared, we develop a design. Um, I, I'm seeing Fred on the screen here, uh, not myself, but there's a design, should be a design behind me um, as my background. That's our uh, local Hudson farm in Urbana. So um, your site will not look like that, uh, but we will design a site for you um, and it'll show you where everything goes on your site and how it fits in with your existing farm activities. This information also goes to the NRCS um, because that's what they use to rank your, rank your project. And then we support you on the implementation of, of the project. Uh, we'll create the working plan. That's the design, uh, the path forward, and guide you through the implementation. Uh, we do have a for-profit um, uh, offshoot of Savannah Institute uh, Canopy that does uh, uh, tree in install and maintenance. Um, and there are other entities in states that also do tree planting. So we, we're working to collect uh, all those those entities and have that um, information available for you as well. Um, obviously, you can also uh, plant your trees yourself. And um, just, I have another note here. So I'm looking through, and I don't know how much time I have, um, but I have like my internal processes. I just want to make sure that everything um, is connected and uh, between the slide you're looking at and, and my uh, cheat sheet here. Um, it's been, feel free to take several more minutes here if you, yep. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically this, this is, this is a, uh, the way I look at it is it, it's, uh, it, uh, I'm just trying to think of the right words. This is a process of, uh, of us working with you. Um, we really need your input, um, to make sure that what, to make sure that the work that we're doing, including the design, meets your needs, and it's something that that we're both uh, on the same page with, because it would make no sense that we turn in a design that you are not familiar with, or a system that you're not familiar with. Um, as I shared too, we have a lot of information online, and if anybody wishes to fami familiarize themselves more so with uh, the different agroforestry practices and related uh, aspects of that, then I, I highly recommend um, that you uh, go to our website and, and look for this material. We're also on YouTube, and as I mentioned, uh, Perennial AF Podcast. Um, if you're interested in um, technical assistance by someone like myself in Illinois, or um, Matter and Omar in Wisconsin. Um, there is on our website, uh, let me just actually, just want to guide you there. And I'm, that's pretty much um, all that I have. Let me see. One second, I'm sorry. 
So if you're looking at our website, um, you can go to programs and scroll to the bottom where it says technical service. And there's a uh, green uh, button for you to apply for technical service. Um, and then next to programs, we do have uh, categories of, of information, online courses, publications, um, perennial AF podcast, and so on. So these are resources for you. They're, uh, and they're generally available for everybody. I'm um, just trying to think if there's anything more that I need to add. And if not, um, any questions can be uh, asked in the, um, in the Q&A after. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Sven. Uh, uh, so we uh, do want to uh, urge you to kind of make note of this great free resource that we have here. Uh, Sven and, and uh, we'll have one other person uh, allocated specifically to Illinois, uh, whose whole job is to uh, give uh, free one-on-one -on -one consultation and assistance uh, to folks uh, sizing up agroforestry on their farm in Illinois. And as Sven alluded to, we can even call in some help uh, from some other staff on that team uh, based in neighboring states. Um, and uh, yeah, as Sven said, uh, uh, take a look at the website and, and it will also uh, let you know of a, a few other things we do. Uh, we have a, a staff that can uh, you know, kind of gateway through uh, our, our farmer facing team. We have a, a staff that works on market development, helping people connect with markets uh, and figure out the economics of that. Um, and we also have, and I, I want to just uh, give you this opportunity to engage uh, before then I open it up for Q&A, um, we have a network of demonstration farms uh, in Illinois and events that happen there uh, that are a great resource. Um, as Sven mentioned, uh, you can find uh, uh, both in a, a demo farm section of our website uh, and an event calendar. Uh, you can see what's going on there. Uh, the slate of 2023 field days uh, will be uh, up on that event calendar for the, the season here uh, about two weeks from now. Um, but there are, we've got a couple real gems of alley cropping demonstration sites uh, near Monticello, Illinois, uh, uh, inside the Allerton Park facility, uh, and just east of Champaign-Urbana, something we call Hudson Farm that are demonstrations of uh, agroforestry integrated with large scale uh, grain farming. Uh, we've got uh, a site near Oregon, Illinois, uh, that's a silvopasture demonstration. Uh, we've got a, a site uh, that's on the University of Illinois South Farms in Champaign that we're just taking over stewardship of that's a demonstration of uh, highly diversified uh, kind of ecologically intensive uh, orcharding of, of food crops. Um, and so a lot to take in uh, and, uh, and an event calendar that uh, should be accessible to you on the web here in, in a couple of weeks. Lastly, um, I'm going to post, I should have made a slide about this, but I'll put it in the chat. Uh, we actually have another soil health event coming up uh, here in about two weeks uh, uh, that I just put information about in the chat, uh, co-organized between Savannah Institute and Delta Institute. Uh, and so you'll hear uh, on similar themes, but from a different set of speakers, uh, Eric Hagan, our uh, home demonstration farm manager in Wisconsin, and uh, Randy Jackson from University of Wisconsin. Um, so consider checking out uh, uh, that free opportunity if this has uh, whetted your uh, appetite uh, to hear about uh, agroforestry. Um, so yeah, so as we turn to Q&A, uh, um, uh, the chat is one great avenue. Uh, feel free to also uh, unmute and you're welcome to turn your camera on if you, if you wish to ask questions that way. Um, but I'll kick it off uh, here with the question uh, here from Claire Hodge in the, in the chat. Um, uh, she says, it's my understanding that Illinois NRCS is behind Wisconsin. Uh, so plan uh, slash project understanding will take a lot of work and funding could be quite delayed uh, if available at all. Is that uh, is that true? Uh, Sven, there's no political minefield uh, there, but but, uh, you know, th this is actually a big part of what Sven does is helping folks navigate this. So Sven. Um, yeah, any assistance? I'm, I'm just going to joke here. Um, to be honest, I. I'm in agreement, and I think that's primarily due to 
the farming practices, the historic aspect of farming practices in Illinois versus Wisconsin. Um, and we're primarily looking at central Illinois um, with a lot of big corn and bean. We're you know, looking at uh, conventional uh, crops uh, as a primary driver and the work that the NRCS has been doing over the years um, is tied to the resource concerns from, from those uh, particular crops. Uh, Wisconsin has more, they, obviously they, Wisconsin has corn and beans, but they also got uh, a lot of diversified farms, uh, cattle operations, dairy operations, and so on. Uh, at a greater, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, statistically greater than, than uh, say Central Illinois, though you know Southern Illinois it gets more diversified again, um, and so it's just it's from the historical agricultural practices in the state. So we are working directly with uh, folks at the state level to get uh, ag more agroforestry into the lexicon of district conservationists and soil conservationists under them. Um, a recent project uh, was a civil pasture project in Southern Illinois where I was working directly with the grazing specialist at the state level. And these are the types of relationships that we're working to build and strengthen in Illinois, which will in turn make the process easier. One thing I will want to stress is, um, so we, we do have this, you know, this, these two cohorts, this two core, core I'm sorry, this two core cohort model uh, for the season, and that's to help us with our work and how we, we work with clients. Um, but a design process, that does not necessarily mean that the design process will only take three or four months. Some of these projects uh, can you know, take years. Um, and a good example, again, is grazing. Um, you know, a client needs to have livestock on their site. A resource concern has to be identified um, let's just pretend that's fencing, waterers, something of that nature, that a client can then apply for a grazing plan. Um, so that application period takes time. The plan creation takes time. What I just mentioned with the Civil Pasture Project is getting trees into the thought process in that planning stage. Um, and again, that's simply for the grazing plan that doesn't at that time, it does not include trees. So that's why we're having, we're trying to infiltrate, um, in a sense, the NRCS to or uh, conservation planners mindsets, like trees are an option here, because then that, that conservation plan or that grazing plan can spit out silvopasture as a recommended practice. And then basically we're, we're in, um, and that's our goal broadly in like working with the NRCS outside of, you know, funding structures and so on and so forth. It's really to bring um, the, the idea of trees in the landscape in early on in, in landowners and NRCS's uh, thought processes. Thank you, Svan. And, and so I hope, uh, I hope you all have a sense here. So we're in the, uh, we're doing a new thing uh, on the landscape here, new to our time and, and culture at any rate uh, with agroforestry. Um, and so it's not at the point where it's easy, uh, but it's also doable. And, uh, and there's, uh, there's people to, to walk that path with you, uh, both on the, the designing the system and, and navigating the, the NRCS process. And do want to acknowledge that uh, our NRCS colleagues uh, are, are here to, to be helpful and to make an impact too, and, and are working to to, uh, to just try to add this to their uh, fully to their their toolbox and their programs. Um, yeah, Sven, I'll just I'll let you uh, just take the follow up in the, the chat here directly. Sure, I'm I'm looking at that right now. Um, so Savannah Institute primarily focuses on the five uh, NRCS USDA recognized agroforestry practices. I do want to share that there are associated practices with that, um, such as tree shrub, uh, uh, tree shrub site prep and so on. Um, and depending on, like, like civil pasture in Illinois is actually tree shrub establishment with tree shrub site prep. It just happens to 
those feed into silvo the silvo pasture um, practice, and then that's based upon number of trees per acre. So it, it gets kind of confusing there. So in, to answer the question, are there certain projects, silvo pasture, food forest, et cetera, that we're more focused on, as well as farm sizes? So we'll I'll refer to that as scale. That makes it worthwhile for us to uh, for Savannah Institute, this is key to work on. So some of this is based upon the practices recognized in the different states that we're working in, and it's primarily right now Illinois and Wisconsin. Um, food forests, as much as I love them, I've got a permaculture background, is one that we provide more resources on than the design side. Um, because uh, I, I'm, I don't, I don't actually believe at the moment that food forests are financially supported or cost share supported by the NRCS in either state. Um, Silva pasture, absolutely. Alley cropping, absolutely. Um, riparian buffers, I believe as well. Um, and so we, we have internally, like kind of ranked these practices as ones that we're more focused on. But the best bet is to come forward, um, whether it's, excuse me, contacting us directly or, or even um, if one wants to take the step of, uh, of filling out our, uh, that intake uh, portion of our website that I mentioned earlier, um, we can help. We're also looking to put a, a resources page um, alongside that. But the best bet is to contact us and then we will um, work with you to try to understand what it is you're looking for. And, you know, if the language being used is not like strictly agroforestry or um, then we'll try to understand, you know, what it is you're looking to do and whether we can give you a hand on that. If not, then we can most likely direct you to resources. As far as scale <laughs> and acreage, I mean, I just turned in uh, an eighth of an acre um alley cropping system it fell into um a tree shrub establishment but it was eight tenths of an acre um i'm sorry not an eighth of an acre eight tenths of an acre um that it was basically rows of trees on contour and the landowner is going to be running chickens between them um that would not be silvo pasture because uh that's tied to ruminants but and then behind me um I can't see because I can't see my face. Um, we have Hudson Farm, that's 120 acres, and that's got a windbreak alley cropping and, th and three different types of alley cropping systems on it. So we, you know, we work on all of that. I think, scale, and this is something internally too, I did mention Canopy, scale comes into play because they're a for-profit business um, as far as tree planting, and they've got their uh, costs associated with getting a team and equipment to a site and some of that may could be cost prohibitive or or not it really really depends and and for that then it's it's highly recommended that um that a landowner works with canopy on that and we and we work with canopy as well so oftentimes we end up in um this triangle as we share data between the entities and and try to figure out what works best for, for a landowner. Um, but yes, I mean, all of these do play a role. Um, it's just, the, really the answer is it depends. And, um, and sadly that's the way with, with, with most things. Uh, yeah. see what we well, and really, I mean, Sven, uh, correct me if this is, is, is off target, but I think folks really should like when in doubt, like, you know, contact your team through the information on the, technical service program page on the web. And, you know, there's a lot of different pathways to deploying agroforestry. And if, uh, you know, for pathways that include getting NRCS funding, um, you know, you can, can help people work out uh, how do they uh, package and plan uh, so that they can, can get that funding. Or if their goals aren't compatible with NRCS, what NRCS can do, you know, whether there's still a way to proceed, you know, with with some other economic model, right? Uh, 
Oh, absolutely. We work with clients that, that are not seeking NRCS uh, cost share funding. I mean, some don't want to work with the government. To be honest, it is bureaucratic. There's you know a lot of paperwork, a lot of time in between the steps uh, just because of their calendaring and their scheduling um, and pooling of data to look through it all in one shot. Um, so, so things can, can take a while um, in working with the NRCS. I do generally recommend that the NRCS is involved even if one does not seek cost share funding, just because it gives another, an, another set of eyes to the landscape. And it's primarily through uh, that site visit and or the, re, and so that's within that site visit are the resource concerns. Um, and ones that I may not see because so or may not understand fully because the NRCS's work is very broad and my work is very, very narrow, though sometimes it feels broad, uh, very narrow, um, just tied to the, the practices of agroforestry. So, um, but then that doesn't mean that one necessarily has to go for NRCS cost share funding, but we do our design work primarily to meet via the, the, the standards that the NRCS asks for and the, using the, the documentation that they ask for. Um, so either way, so let's just say I, uh, somebody's got a landscape, they're looking for, um, uh, we'll make it easy, uh, an alley cropping system. You know, we'll get the NRCS out there for a site visit with us. We'll learn about the resource concerns the system will be designed to address those resource concerns as well as the landowner's goals. Um, then the output, the documentation from that um, will meet NRCS input requirements or their documentation requirements, but that doesn't mean that a landowner slash client needs to turn that information in. You could hold on to it for a year, hold on to it for five years, as long as there's no changes really to that that landscape, so to make that design uh, irrelevant and that information packet that goes along with that irrelevant, that could be turned in at any point in time to the NRCS, or the landowner can just work on it themselves and with our support. So um, I hope that answers that question. <clears throat> I see one here. One here yeah, on. You want to jump on the coppicing one here, Sven? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, we do not do any coppicing at our demonstration sites. Um, do I have any resource recommendations around that practice? Yes. Mark Krychek just put out a book called uh, Coppice Agroforestry. I don't know if you're familiar with that, Allison. Um, I, I've enrolled in that course. Sadly, I haven't had a lot of time to sit. Um, in, in, in that course, um, but I, I would highly recommend that book. It's one of the few out there and most definitely the newest um, coppicing book out there. Um, if I knew this question was gonna be asked, then I would uh, have been more than happy to hold the book up and so on. But uh, the name of the book is Coppice Agroforestry and it's written by Mark Krychek, a personal friend out in uh, Vermont. Um, and I, I do recommend it at least for, uh, and it's, it's very, very well put together. Um, it's got a lot of information in it. And um, the course right now, I can't remember who, I know Javon Bernakovich is working with Mark on the course, but I can't remember the uh, URL um, for that uh, or Javon's business that runs that. But um and I do have a client coming up. I'm going to be visiting in the next few weeks. Who's got black locust in a in a um, in a riparian buffer system that they were talking about bulldozing. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa! Maybe you don't need to do that. <laughs> Maybe you know you can coppice that and and you know uh, get fence posts and other materials from that. So I won't know about more about that until I see it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I'd like to see more of that because that also too, um, if anybody listens to Eric Tonesmeyer, any of that material that comes off of a tree that's that's turned into a product, a basket, uh, a fence post, um, a house, 
that's that's sequestering carbon, especially if that tree is allowed to continue to grow. So um, that's very important. I see I've got five new messages. Great, and, and let me, um, I, I wanna make sure we uh, we wrap up here in time for uh, Illinois Stewardship Alliance to, to use this line for their next thing. Um, but just quickly to a couple of really good questions here, one about climate change and planning ahead. Um, number one, uh, just our staff, uh, Sven and his colleagues can help you think through uh, just based on their knowledge of where different uh, tree crop species and varieties uh, are adapted to uh, how we think ahead on climate change. And then we're just starting a research project here right now that is mapping suitability for different tree crops. There are a couple dozen species based on future climate change scenarios. So have some detailed information coming out on that. And then finally, I'll end with a great question to end on uh, from Janet here on agri for agroforestry to scale and last over time. There has to be financial uh, you know, foundation for it beyond grants and philanthropy. And that's right. And, and I'll say, I think fundamentally over time, agroforestry is a, is a, a food production system. It's an agricultural system. Uh, so I think the, the main uh, financial support for agroforestry uh, is going to be revenue, revenue from uh, harvested fruit and nut crops that are you know, marketed to markets that we grow over time uh, and increased revenue from increased uh, you know, productivity of crop and livestock systems that trees are, are integrated with. I, I, that's uh, already a factor that can be benefited from and that, that, that will pin down uh, over time. So I think that's the long-term play. Uh, and then it's putting, um, uh, getting the whole existing playbook on how to grow trees really well into service uh, and navigating the incentives that are available uh, uh, the best we can. So really appreciate uh, uh, you folks uh, attending here, Illinois Stewardship Alliance uh, for uh, putting this series on and my colleagues uh, here for joining me. So thanks, have a good day.